Welcome to the Natural Alternative Podcast. I'm Madonna Guy, your host, and I'm here today with Claire Gallia, who is a energy healer, mentor, and teacher. Welcome, Claire. Thank you, Madonna. Good to see you. Good to see you too. So I've known you for several years now, and the work that you've been doing with the uh, Kundalini activation process has been intriguing me for several years now. And I know that as you've developed your processes with energy healing and mentoring, that you're finding all sorts of interesting uh, challenges with people on the planet at the moment. So can you tell me a little bit about what you're finding and how you got into this healing modality? I, um, I got into the healing modality quite by accident, actually. I never wanted to be a healer. I always have been a writer and journalist and I was invited to go to um, it was a, 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 um, an intensive weekend and didn't realize that if you attended this intensive weekend it was hosted by Bernard Wong who is the um, sort of founder of this particular modality and if you go to the weekend you get the opportunity to be invited to become a facilitator and, uh, and I got invited and uh, um, I was delighted and, and here we are. Um, and then in terms of what I've been seeing lately on the planet, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of fear actually in the people that come to see me, uh, which, is, which is heartbreaking. Um, and their sort of issues and their daily problems that we all, we all uh, have to confront, we all are faced with, um, seem to be overwhelming at the moment, more so than before. And these issues are coming up for them to address, which is what we do in the sessions. Yes. And are you finding some, like obviously what I've been seeing for the last two and a half years, the fear is because there is so much propaganda being driven at us as human beings. What are you finding from your perspective, that underlying cause of the fear? Like, is it the same stuff that I'm seeing or is it a whole different level where it's generational or ancient ancestry stuff or karmic or, like, what are you finding? I feel like it's um, a perfect storm. Um, so it's a combination of everything, whether or not they realise it. So... Um, so their ancestral patterning, uh, as one example, means that certain issues in their life, you know, we, we tend to, we'll find that, we may find that our lives go in circles and it might be one or two recurring issues uh, that keep coming back. And um, most commonly they're relationship issues, health issues and or financial issues. And they can be, or childhood trauma as well can keep, keep bubbling up. Um, and so what's happening at the moment is that with everything else that's going on, um, the sort of collective fear that we're all feeling at the moment, uh, it's creating this, uh, it's creating an inability for people to be able to cope in the way that they once might have done. It's all becoming too overwhelming. And it feels like everything's intensifying and speeding up. So uh, it won't just be one issue. So, for example, if um, financial crises seems to be a pattern in someone's life, they'll have two or three at once, not just one. Normally we might have one, like the car breaking down, and then we'll be given time to get over it and carry on, and then we'll have a breathing space, and then something else might happen. But we're finding this sort of collection, and it is like a perfect storm, and people aren't coping. It's, uh, it's serious overwhelm at the moment. Um, and these issues are bringing up, are being brought up, obviously, for us to heal and address. Yeah, so that's what I'm thinking. If it feels like everything's speeding up energetically on the planet at the moment, is that why normally there would be that curve of, you know, this trauma, then this, or crisis, this crisis, and this, then this, but it's all just happening faster at the moment? Like, is that what you're sort of saying? Absolutely, yes, it, it, it really is. So, for example... I've been on my healing journey for 16 years and I feel as if I have learned so much more and come so far in the past three years because everything is so much more intense. And a lot of people coming to me, they describe sort of, you know, when they sort of, when, when someone might 
wake up one day and realize that they can't take it anymore like their life in terms of um right I've had enough this is I'm I'm done with this I'm leaving my job or I'm leaving my relationship or I'm going on a diet I'm going to become fit and healthy for example um when they realize that they want to change their lives in a really significant and meaningful way they often refer to it as an awakening or the day I woke up um and so a lot of people that are coming to me at the moment say that their awakening was but within the past two, two or three years. Um, and that's a lot of people. I'd say the majority of people that come to see me at the moment say, uh, I had this experience two years ago, or I had this experience three years ago, and, uh, and it changed my life. And that's what I'm seeing a lot of. Yeah, so it is a lot in more intense, a lot faster. And people are learning and growing and developing in leaps and bounds that we've never seen before. Yeah, and I think people always assume that when you wake up to something like that, that it's only a positive thing. That's right. Yes, that's right. As with anything, there's ups and downs. Yes. Um, and, and potentially more ups and downs because once you're awake, you can't not see those traumas or challenges anymore. That's right. It's the red pill. It's most yes. definitely the red pill from the, from the matrix. Once the bell's been lifted, but you realise it's the only way. There is no other way. Yes. This is the, this is the path. And it, regardless of how bumpy it might be, you just have to go through it. The yeah. rewards at the other side are, you know, going to be better than you can possibly imagine. But yeah. you've got to do the work on the way. You know, there's a lot of dross. Because you've got to clear, you know, you've got to empty a bucket before you can fill it with clean water. It's the yes. same with vessels. And so you've got to clear the us as a vessel you've got to clear the energy and clean it and and refresh it and that's a gradual process you can't do it overnight no no and it feels like one of the words that just keeps coming back over the last two two and a half years that the energy is really dense so you've you know to let that stuff go you can't do anything except to raise the vibration you know and anything you can do to do that is the only way to let go of that density because that density is holding us back, it's holding us down, it's affecting every single cell in our body from at that micro level. And then if we're walking around with that density in our cells and our energy fields, we're sharing that with other humans as well. That's exactly right. It's like walking into a room and knowing that someone's had just had an argument in that room, you can feel it, you can feel the, the density in the air. And I describe it like wearing concrete shoes you know there's these there's these this effect um, that our body can have over us um, uh, you know the, the sort of patterning we contain on a cellular level that affects every single thought it's behind every single thought process every word every deed everything we do and we might not be aware of it and we that's why our lives go in circles we're just caught on this merry-go-round um, because we don't live our lives consciously in the present moment on a daily basis. And, and that takes discipline, actually. This is what Buddha always preached about the present moment, the importance of the present, mo present moment. But the reason is why, but the reason why is that so that we're aware of our subconscious thought patterns that are actually have a lot more control over our life than our conscious patterns do. Yes. I mean, that, yeah, that's quite, uh, once you realise that, it's quite um, uh, an eye-opener in itself. Yeah, I, do, I know numbers change in as we learn more, but I always understood that it's about 3 to 10% of our frontal cortex that's up and running, and that's our conscious brain, so that's our what we have control of in this moment. About 70% of our brain is in that subconscious area, so that's the tens of thousands of star, of thoughts and patterns from our life and our generational life and our karmic life that has an has a subconscious control over everything we're moving through so when we wake up and we say today i'm going to eat well exercise do my stretching and think positively but you've got 120,000 negative influences that are you know affecting us and we don't even get to 10 o'clock in the morning before we've had three coffees and a cream bun and haven't done our exercise, you know. So it's, there's, yeah, so about 70% in the subconscious and then the remainder in the unconscious. Uh, so because our frontal cortex, that conscious area of our brain, 
is such a small part. We have to exercise it in order to be in that consciousness, to be in that now present moment. Is that sort of what you find? Yeah, that's that's exactly it. And I think it's quite horrifying when you realise how little control we actually do have. We think because we think that we're in control of our lives, control of our these conscious decisions. And the idea that we're actually puppets or slaves to our subconscious mind, you know, or our, our ego. I mean, it's a Freudian concept. Yes. Uh, it's nothing new and it's scientifically proven as well. But it's quite, quite uh, unnerving in a way. And the way I describe it to my clients, I mean, this is when we move into epigenetics, which I love. I love the whole, you know, explanation of science behind it. Um, but it's the research done on rats, rats or mice, or people say rats, where um, the smell of lavender was wafted into the cage and the rat was um, subjected to pain, or whether it's a, a little electrical impulse, I would imagine, something like that. And their response was monitored. And so the rat then had babies and, and more babies and, you know, the children so we went we go down through the, the lineage to sort of the great great grandchildren of that rat who are not subjected to pain but have the smell of lavender wafted into their cage their response is monitored and they respond in fear still so that is a wonderful scientific explanation of how we can inherit our great 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 grandmother's emotional experiences um, and let's face it those days were hard yes times were hard so there's a high likelihood that they've had a negative emotional experience and we can inherit that without even realizing and it can affect the way we react it can we can have unknown and hidden triggers to events um, and without understanding quite why um, and they they control our decisions so for example uh, you know, shyness. Shyness is a, a is just ego, um, because it's what we identify with. It's what it's where, how we identify with our personality, and it can be an inherited trait. And um, so many people are afraid of public speaking, but ask them why. You know, why is it? Where does it come from? And um, yeah. it can be something that we've inherited, um, and that's what we really want to address, because otherwise we're going through life unconscious. Yeah, and sort of thinking about the little rat mice experiments with the lavender, uh, my understanding is that it's up to seven generations that we can have coming through our epigenetics. And I think that must have been rat or mice studies that they did that through where they traumatised someone and then sort of gave them the, you know, did the generational thing and they found that the trauma. So it's probably the same study we're talking about. Yes, yeah, uh, and that's very interesting actually because a lot there's a lot of different types of energy healing out there, and most commonly they will go back to the seventh. If you're mm. if you if you have a if you're in a ceremony where you're cutting ties or cords or healing and crystal passing and wounding, they normally go back seven generations. Wow. Yeah, I think the understanding is that's as far as you need to go back, and then it will heal the rest of the timeline. The rest yeah, of beautiful. The so what sort of people are coming to see you at the moment? Like it sounds like like it sounds like fear is an overriding factor. Because yeah. some because people usually won't do anything unless there's so much pain or punishment that they can't cope with it anymore. You know, there's a certain level that we can put up with. You know, we can put up with a lot of crap in our lives until one day it's just too much. And that's when we ask for help. They they What's nice is that I'm seeing a wide variety. So I have some people who um, who are at their wits end. So, um, so for example, a recent client came to me and in spite of the fact that they're sort of mortgage-free, they live on acreage, um, they've got two kids happily married, the husband has suffers extreme anxiety we've had both both I've seen both I've treated them individually the, the couple um and uh, they don't you know they don't know how to fix their lives so they've got you know medical issues issues with their sons I think one is uh, on the autism spectrum 
and they're not coping. The wife has trauma from um, a very a, a very traumatic birth, and then the first year or two of her first child's life was um, also very traumatic for her, and so she's being triggered. So this sort of scenario where you get, I mean, most or a lot of people have maybe financial issues. So it's hard for them to understand how someone who has absolutely no financial issues whatsoever, how can they still have problems? And so we've seen a mixed, a real mixed variety of people. There are also people who have had their awakening, uh, those that have, you know, uh, within the past two or three years, like I mentioned, who want to explore. And this is quite exciting, actually. There are a lot of people who have woken up, they're seeing the world as it is, they're feeling the density, they're not convinced by the whole scenarios that we're, that we're you know, being thrust upon us and, and that we see in the media. And they want to explore their um, situation in more detail. The, and their spirituality, their, their whole sort of journey, their soul journey. And they're trying all these different modalities and they're get, really looking for a deeper sense of understanding as to what's going on in the world, why are they here, what's their purpose, how does the world work, um, that kind of thing. So we've got a real, there's more of a split than ever before, actually, I think, in terms of um, those people who are so overwhelmed and can't cope, and those others who have had their beautiful spiritual awakening in the past two to three years and are on this journey and are actually feeling really uplifted um, in a way that they've never felt before. And, th and this is what you know, we would really like to focus on at the moment is because those people um, in being, you know, being more heart-centered and happier in themselves and excited by their journey can spread that, can go out and spread that. They go out with a smile on their face and they say hello to strangers and they're you know, passing it forward and that kind of thing. Um, so we're seeing a real split at the moment, like never before, really. Which is yes. Really and I find that a lot of my anxious clients, they were really happy to have to wear a mask, you know, because they don't have to be nice to people. They don't have to smile. They can hide away and people don't look at you that much when you've got a mask on. So I've got some clients who have been in quite a bad place who have actually enjoyed the separation, the isolation, the distancing the uh, not being allowed to have more than X number of people at your house at a time. And they've almost utilised that, but they've gone spiralling down. It hasn't helped them at all. They've gone yeah. spiralling down because it's accentuated everything that they were already fearful of on the planet. And they've allowed themselves because it's been decreed by, you know, the world head honchos that it's not only okay, but you're the better person if you do all of that. So it's like it's added to their ego defence mechanisms to allow them to be that person without needing to think about, gee, maybe I should work on this. So I feel like some people are further into the density of the planet at the moment. Yes. Yes, I agree. Um, because I think what I find heartbreaking is not shaking hands with people when you meet them for the first time or not hugging old friends when you become reacquainted. It's, um, it's a terrible division. And I think in terms of wearing masks, uh, it, is, it is giving permission to people to hide. And that's not, gonna, that's not going to be solving their issues um, or healing them in any way. No. And I think what's, what's interesting as well is um, I was sitting, I was, sit, I was going to see my osteopath and I was sitting and waiting and I had to wear my mask, of which I'm not a big fan. So this mother came out with a baby. The baby must have been about, I don't know, one and a half, two in her arms. And the way that baby looked at me, you know, I was sort of smiling through my mask and it was really cute, but the way that he looked at me, and I thought that poor child, he's what this whole generation because if you think about it, you know, how 80 or 90% of our communication is meant to be non-verbal. These children are not learning uh, significant and important ways of communicating. Yes. Um, and I think that's really dangerous because I think, you know, being a wordsmith and a writer and a, a journalist, a nice journalist, not a... <laughs> 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 um, that was in another life. 
But communication is so important to me, and words and how they're perceived and interpreted is so important to me. Um, and I feel that with social media, et cetera, uh, so much of our communication is already being lost. And even though our language is supposed to be increasing in terms of number of words, a lot of the new words that are being added to dictionaries are slang or abbreviations and technical words, the technology that never existed before. But in terms of our adjectives, our descriptive words, it's, it's reducing. And so wearing a mask and not having this facial expression as a form of communication is just creating another divide and reducing, it's like 1984 over again, yeah. when, you know, George Orwell, new speak, changing and reducing the language that people can't object uh, because they don't have the words to express what it is, what their thought processes are. And I think it's a shame. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and they've already started releasing studies now on the damage that's happening to children who haven't seen people's faces. So yeah. there's all, yeah, they've already found that the IQ is lowered for kids who have been looking at people with masked parents and and teachers and daycare workers and all sorts of things. So it, yeah, there's already data showing that the damage is real from an IQ perspective, from a learning perspective, from an anxiety social perspective. I thought that's interesting that you confirmed that because that was one of my, it was a thought process and it was a concern of mine and the fact that you said that yeah I'm not surprised at all I'm worried greatly worried and upset I find it really upsetting but I'm not surprised at all um my daughter works in retail and she was talking to a woman who had moved up to I mean Queensland and moved up to the Gold Coast from Melbourne and the woman it was during a period where we weren't wearing masks up here but this woman was and she had developed agoraphobia uh, she was so full of fear uh, that she found it difficult to go out and could not stop wearing her mask because she felt so full of fear and unprotected. And that, and this is the effect that it's having on a lot of people. Yes. So, so yes, any sort of form of modality or healing that's going to alleviate that in, in any way, you know, I always encourage people to do whatever works for them. Yes. So I think chatting a bit about energy healing, what it is, what it does, what it doesn't do is probably quite important. Yes, I think what's interesting is what it doesn't do um, because a, a, a lot of people come to me in fact, I had one, well, they come to me and they expect to be healed. And I had one lady recently <laughs> who messaged me, bless her, and said, um, so how many sessions do I need to pay for then before you heal me? You know, how, how long would it take? Five, six? And so I replied, I said, well, put it this way. I've been on my journey for 16 years and I don't feel healed at all yet. You know, I'm still on my journey. And, uh, and one story I love, actually, is that Buddha, it took Buddha 24 lifetimes to become enlightened. So I think there's hope for us yet. Um, but it is, it is a process. And if you think of it in terms of how you can measure everybody's field in megahertz, you know, that we do have a vibration, we have a particular frequency, we have a, a, an energy field. And the process is actually to raise the frequency of that energy field and the energy in your body gradually. Um, and the reason why it has to be done gradually is because quite literally, if you turn up that dial too quickly, you can you just short circuit. And I remember looking at pictures in the 70s when I was a kid, actually. There was this phenomenon. I don't know if you... Uh, spoken to some people over here about it and no one had heard of it they looked at me like I was crazy but there was this phenomenon uh being discussed in the UK about um uh what was it um spontaneous combustion and I now where someone would literally and it sounds revolting it's easy but explode from the inside out it would just happen instantaneously and they couldn't work out why and so I describe that to my clients and I feel that the process of raising your frequency 
can be like that. If you can't do it too quickly because you will probably spontaneously combust. So unfortunately, there's no switch that you can flick that's going to cure you. No. You have to raise your frequency slowly and slowly, gradually, more and more. But as you do, you are then, uh, your, your, it's a detox as well. So someone comes to see me and we're doing uh, an energy healing, what it involves is um, a transference of high frequency energy. And then part of the process is to switch on or activate that life force energy in them that's in all of us and in, in everything. So, you know, the collective consciousness or the quantum field or whatever it is you want to call it is to activate it in them. And then as you feel your frequency increasing, you'll see it uh, sort of um, moving out into your life. It's like a, a ripple ripping out into your life. And it will affect your behavior, your thought processes gradually. So uh, people come to me and, and this is kind of like, you know, quite an intense dose. Uh, it is an upgrade, so to speak. And afterwards, there was one lady, <laughs> there was one lady that said, um, I'm a real junk food addict. And now all I want to do is juice. I'm juicing every day. So it, it's that kind of, it's that kind of effect. It's to steer you towards, um, habits and behaviors that are going to support your body to heal itself. So it's a detox process. You, you will feel um, toxins releasing from your body. And then it's to encourage uh, certain behaviors and practices in your life to support um, the, the new frequencies to sort of maintain them. Um, because, because frequency can come and go. So you can have a healing, you can have a healing and you feel great and light and grounded and you get that Zen feeling that oh, of peace, but that won't last. Um, and so there are practices that you can do in your life to try and make that last as long as possible and to support that frequency. Yes. Um, because there aren't any miracle cure. Well, there are oh, miracles do exist, but you know, but um the majority of us it's uh, step by step process. Yes, and I think I find the same thing. People walk back out into life. They walk into the same relationships. They walk into the jobs. They walk into their financial challenges. They walk into their life with their kids and partners or lack thereof. They walk out there into the earth with all of that energy. You can't stay at that high vibration or it's challenging, you know, when you're going back out into that normality that is our world. That's exactly right. Uh, you know, people do um, Vipassana or Vipassana, the, whichever way you pronounce it, which is that 10-day Buddhist retreat in total silence. You're not allowed to talk for 10 days and you meditate from like 4.30 in the morning to 9.30 at night. You're really floating when you come out of an experience like that. Or, you know, even if you go to a day spa or weekend retreat, you, you come out all floaty. But you can get home and you hear your kids arguing and you go, you oh. <laughs> know, Straight away, it can lower your vibration. So it's really, um, that's where the sort of self-work kicks in. You know, exactly. Is you can do on a daily basis to, to maintain that. Because it so is, what type of things, what type of things do you get people to do on a daily basis? Um, I think there's a sort of, you know, I say boring practical things. There's a sort of everyday things like um, in terms of examining your nutrition. Um I'm not 100% vegetarian, but it is a, is a sort of direction I really want because I'm, you know, I think, you know, there's that book, Eating for Your Blood Type. I think I'm O positive and I'm meant to be the biggest meat eater. And so, but, but it lowers your vibration. Meat does lower your vibration. Um, and the person that I learned from is a raw vegan. And he said that when he switched, he said that the, the, his energy levels just went through the roof, like in terms of not just energy levels, but his frequency. And so in terms of his ability to heal as an energy healer was stronger um, and the information, his intuition really kicked in as well. So there's things like that, watching your diet, um, obviously sleep um, and, and exercise. So they're the sort of, uh, there's a sort of basic practical things. We all know what we should be doing, 
um, but it's about actually doing it. And then there are there are the sort of other sort of spiritual practices that you can do during the day. So so I think our biggest our biggest issue or I- issues that sort of lower our vibration are fear and doubt, um, and they are paralyzing. They are so destructive in terms of progress. And so if you're going through a particularly challenging period. It's about finding the habit or finding the self-discipline to find those moments throughout your day where you can become a bit more centered. And I think we all know that feeling, or at least I hope we've all experienced that feeling, even momentarily in our lives, where in your heart space there's that, there's that beautiful sense of peace and calm. It's like taking that big breath in and then when you hold it for a second, then you can feel your whole body and your energy and your mind just settle into that breath. It's that feeling, and it's how do we get that feeling back into our day um, as often as we can um, to recenter ourselves, to kind of recalibrate and be, become more aware of our thoughts. So there's, there's sort of that element as well. And then there's that self-awareness as well. You know, how am I reacting to this person who's being completely obnoxious <laughs> that I really want to give a piece of my mind? How am I going to handle that situation? So that's the other reason why Buddha sort of stresses about being in the present moment. It's about how you're going to react um, in certain situations. Because anger, uh, anger is a gene. Um, uh, you know, the human genome project in, from Cambridge University in the 90s uh, discovered you know, that, that anger and pessimism or anxiety, worry, or genetics. So it's how, how do, that can tear your energy field. It can really lower your vibration. Um, and, and it's so how do I handle situations? So they're the kind of things that um, I tell my clients to become aware of that can support themselves. Um, the other great one, actually, I've just found out something else about it, is about grounding. The science behind grounding, like literally just standing with your feet on the ground for 10 or 15 minutes per day, there's a grounding challenge going around on the internet at the moment for 30 days. But the old saying about, you know, people always laugh about tree huggers. Um, And I've done research on the megahertz, you know, measuring someone's megahertz before and after they might have hugged a tree. And... um, the idea is that your, your body's frequency, if you are out in nature, uh, starts to align itself with the energy field of the earth, the magnetic field of the earth. And so, um, and, and it's measurable. Um, and so being out in nature, it's a bit like, for example, there's virtually no SIDS, the, the sudden infant death syndrome or or cop death as we used to call it in third world countries because they very often just live in a hut and sleep together and so the child will sleep with the mother and the child's body the heartbeat starts to regulate with the mother's Um, and it's the same with being in nature like we start to regulate our energy feels start to regulate with, with mother and nature and then the other thing that I learned recently doing some research on it is that the actual transference of the electrons to our feet um, uh, has a, um, uh, is full of antioxidants. And so it helps our nervous system, regulate our nervous system. So we can move out of uh, fight or flight so that the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and we can move our body into a homeostasis and then start to heal ourselves. So there's all these sort of natural things that we can do. Um, and if, it, you know, if you're more of an ocean person than, than uh, uh, you know, a forest person, then you know, be it sitting with your feet in the ocean or on the sand, so healing. I mean, who hasn't been in the ocean, gone in and felt like crap, and then come out and just felt like a different person after yeah. coming out of the ocean? So exactly. those are the kind of things I encourage my clients to do on a daily basis but it takes sort of uh it takes consciousness it takes habit forming Um, it's amazing how often people realize that they have you know especially working from home how easy it is for people just not to leave their house for an entire day or two or three 
until they, you know, and then it's getting in the car, going to the shop, going in the shops. You know, so some people never see natural light for days or weeks at a time. Yeah, I can, and I can be guilty of that myself. Even I've worked from I've worked for myself since nineteen ninety four, and I can get so engrossed on a project, and then I get annoyed with myself, especially with the weather that we've been having lately. And I think, damn, it was sunny yesterday, and I stayed indoors all day long. So I can, you know, even though I, you know, advise my clients to do these things, I know personally how hard it can be to have that that self-discipline to actually yeah. think, no, I'm actually going to go outside and sit on the grass for 10 minutes now. Yes. Yeah. yeah, to remember to do it. That's half the issue is to remember to do these things. Yes. Now, without wanting to uh, delve too much instantly, do you find the specific awakening of the last two years, the specific awakening, are you finding that is big with your clients being challenged moving forwards yes actually um yes and I think the realizations that some people are having about the world not being the way they thought it was uh has really are you are you willing to have that conversation don't stress if you're not oh yes well you see the thing is and I feel really really lucky because I researched all of this, you know, uh, 14 years ago. So, and at that time, it devastated me. Yes. That knowledge of that realisation, yes, I, was, I felt devastated then. But I feel now that because, and in fact, I started writing a book, a novel about it eight years ago, about how um, if you weren't vaccinated or microchipped, you weren't allowed to come into the city and you were sort of outcast. And there were these big sort of, you know, council house like towers and you were relegated to live there. And how people just kind of, you know, the sort of uh, enlightened people or more aware people just dropped out of society and went and lived in communities in the country. So this is about eight, eight years ago, I started writing that. But, um, and so I felt prepared. Um, you know, and, and making other preparations, like buying an RV, for example, because you never know. You never but, know. Yeah. That's right. And so it has enabled me to hold space for those for whom this is news. And, and there's a lot of people that it has truly shaken to the core that are frightened for their family or, you know, worried about their families or where they're going to live or what they're going to do. Um, and it's, it's not really about that. What I try and do when I'm supporting someone who's spiraled into fear and anxiety is that the most important thing to remember is your own happiness and, your, and that of your families. And that is it. That will keep you safe if safe is a word that they need to hear or if, if they're feeling unsafe. But, you know, the only thing that sort of the universe wants for us, the only thing is to be happy and to have a positive experience here on Earth. And I know that sometimes it can be really hard because it is such, you know, we're living in such density here. Um, but for me, I, my focus has always been when I've watched things evolving and, and I, when it first happened, I thought, Oh my gosh, I didn't think it was going to happen for about another 50 years. I didn't think yeah. it was going to happen in, in my lifetime. Um, and so when it started happening, I thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm going to be around for it. Okay, that, that's new. Um, but my focus even then was to not be dragged in emotionally. You can have feelings about it, of course, but to not get swallowed up by your emotions, to make sensible preparations for any eventuality but not focus on that yes um yeah so you can have you know what put whatever you need to in place and then you're done and then you carry on with your daily life and your yes. children squabbling and putting food on the table and having fun on enjoying mother's day and that kind of thing but really really focusing on your family relationships getting those right those relationships with your partner really focusing on on you know what you need to do to keep centered and balanced and happy yes um, because there's so many powers that we have no control over that are so big 
and so strong and so entwined in each other's stuff and they're trying to do so much control, it feels like those things we can't do anything about. You know, those things we can't. You know, that's just the big energy on the planet and that's a big, strong, powerful thing going on. But, yeah, it's those individual things that we can control, the way we're thinking about ourselves. And that's what I've been saying to people for two and a half years. Knowledge is power. You might not think it's empowering you, but by simply having an overall idea about what's going on and getting out, you know, getting your toe, getting your finger, getting your elbow out of, out of the matrix and actually seeing the big picture, it empowers you because then you're not traumatised each time something happens and you go, what are they doing? I can't believe they're doing that. Because at least That's you've had the right. big picture energy of what's going on. You know their plan. Yes, that's exactly right. So you want to not sort of, um, so I keep an eye on events without, like, you know, I've had to sort of unfollow or leave groups that are outraged all the time or full of fear all the time and this event and that event. Um, and I've left because I don't want to, because it's a rabbit hole that you don't really want to go down. There's and no end to those rabbit holes. There's no end. Mm. There's no end. And meanwhile, you're just, you know, your, your aura, your energy field will just shrink. And that's disempowering. You, you can't change the world from a small position of, you know, low vibrational fear uh, with your energy field shrunken. Um, and this is someone who... You know, when I was younger, I always saw myself as an anarchist. And, you know, I grew up in the 80s in the UK where university students used to send their clothes to the mine, people, the miners who were on strike. And that kind of, it was a really radical era. And all the music reflected that. And so I was anti this and anti that. And I went on an anti-apartheid march and this kind of thing. So for someone like that to sort of stand back and say, um, I'm not going to be, you know, sort of physically involved um, uh, and, you know, uh, and my voice being heard. It's a really big thing for me to choose not to maybe, you know, I I'm very careful about what petitions I sign and, you know, I, I did go on the, I did go on the um, uh, anti this and that, the, the freedom march is probably a better way of putting it. Yes, absolutely. Marching. Because I think at some point, you know, you do, you do have to stand up and say, you know, at the end of the day, this is a human rights issue. You know, look yes. at the bigger picture of everything. Um, and so what we've got to do really is, is think about what we can add collectively on a positive note. Um, you know we're... about the studies uh, about energy and how one, per like you've heard the prayer studies where they've looked at a person in a house and they know that if they pray or meditate, and I think it's 15 minutes a day, that the happiness of everyone else in the street goes up. Yes. So they've actually measured that. Yes. And, and I think uh, 15 minutes a day. I, I can't quite recall, but it was an amazing study where you go, well, the people next door are, and I can't remember the numbers, but just say 20% happier and then once next door are 15% happier and the ones... You know, so it lessens the further away people are, but the fact that it affects people at all. That's right. You it's, know. It's fascinating. There were global studies as well. I think they were quite popular, um, I think it was in the 70s and 80s, and they're, they're being done again now. I think Dr. Joe Dispenza might have done one already. Um, having a globally organised meditation hour. Beautiful. And mon monitoring the effects of that. So, they, yeah, so there's... There's profound research that they have to, you know, be open to it. Yes. Um, and that's what I like, you know, that you can look at these, these concepts uh, statistically, which is what I like. I like the science behind it. So it's yes. Not, it's fact and it's proven. And it feels to me like the big agenda by the big globalist people and organisations, they're trying to tell us that we don't have energy. They're trying to tell us we don't need to be connected. They're trying to tell us that hugging is bad and shaking hands is bad and that connection is one of these things that is, you know, bad for all mankind. And it's been 110 years of, you know, a fairly consistent anti-energy, anti-natural, anti, -energy, anti, -natural, anti 
uh, anything that isn't big business. It's 110 years so far of consistent propaganda against anything energy, anything natural, anything about connectedness. Well, that's because they're so afraid of it, because it is really empowering. Um, I think, again, I think there, there were sort of films in the 70s about using um, telepathy and telekinesis as war, um, uh, what's the word? My mind's gone blank. As um, weapons. As right. Weapons. Um, uh, because because it can be so powerful, mm. um, and then and then you find out later on that that's actually, or the rumors are that that's not just a film. You know that that is reality, and that they have been doing, you know, conducting these experiments uh, for years. Yeah. Um, because yeah, that's right. If you are connected to a higher source, if you don't feel fear, if you can't be indoctrinated then you can't be controlled. Um, and that for them is very frightening. Yes. Uh, because that's, you know, to be honest with you, that's what it's about at the end of the day, isn't it? Yes. I think the interesting question is, where do you go when you have so much money that it's like water or it's like air, you know, it becomes, you know, what do you do? How, for, you know, there's that question, how boring is your life or there's nothing else to achieve or and so that's where I think that's where these minds went and you know these the powers that be become so ridiculously rich it's like okay what next you know let's let's do a little bit of <laughs> genetic engineering or you know let's see what, what fun can we have with yeah. the population you know and, and, and have you it. have you heard uh Dr Yaval Noah Harari talk he's the transhumanist who's connected to the world economic forum right okay no i haven't you would love some of his quotes like he talks openly about how for the first time and it, i think this was 2018 he said this so we're going back pre-covid and he said that for the first time ever governments and corporations have the ability to control big groups of mankind so we're talking four years ago, and he was saying, you think those thoughts are your thoughts? You know, and he, you know, puts down God, he puts down faith. He says, we are now the gods. So he's an interesting character to go check out some of his quotes. He's a, And he's, like, right up there in the World Economic Forum. Yeah, that is just terrifying, really, if you think about it. It's like I finally got round to watching that uh, Netflix documentary about Facebook. Oh, yes. And I thought it was just going to be about data farming. Uh, you know, how we're all just, you know, they're just collecting all of our information so that they can market to us and this, that and the other. It was so much more than that. So, it so it's so worth fun. watching. I haven't watched it because it really because my it, hubby said, oh, we know all that anyway. We know that they're, you know, doing data mining and. Yeah, no, it's it's next level. It's along the lines of what we, you know, discussed before. How um, it's actually about, and I can't remember what country they mentioned though, uh, but it was about how they started a revolution in a third world. Are we not supposed to use third world anymore? I think someone told me off using the word third world, but in an underdeveloped country, how they started a revolution via Facebook, <laughs> and it's like. You know, I watched it and went, oh, my God, that's terrifying. Yeah. Um, I hadn't really thought about it in those terms. I thought it was about, you know, global greed and marketing products and services. Um, but in terms of influencing and inciting riots and revolutions and also, you know, we've all heard about Facebook bullying in schools. Yes, Yes. But they take it again, they take it next level in terms of assassination of one's opponent. If they're a political figure, for example, they could just tweet or have a throwaway comment and they're about how their lives would be easier if their opponent would just to suddenly disappear. And then someone, one of their followers might take that and want their problem solved. And it's, yeah, it, 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 it is worth watching. It was more than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so we've only got a couple of minutes left. What would you like to tell people 
uh, to finish off with, Claire? Like how can they contact you? Uh, what, you know, what would you like to finish off with? Um, I think on a, on a, a, a note of hope, uh, really would be would be great that this journey the journey is not going to solve your problems overnight and believe me there's been points in my life where I really hope that it would um, but it it is it's going to get you there it's a slower process than you might want or need at the moment but it's it it's the only way forward it will get you to where you want to go patience unfortunately is, is key um, but it is an amazing journey of self-discovery and growth. And it will, um, it will certainly weed out what you don't need and who you don't need in your life and draw to you those who genuinely love and support you. So even for that reason alone, it's worthwhile. Yeah. Um, I set up a, a Facebook page, I sort of changed direction. So it's fairly new. And I'm in the process of setting up a website, but my Facebook page is called The Etheric Soul. And the idea of that is our energy body is the etheric body. And it's the bridge between our sort of physical body and our other levels of energy and consciousness. And so the idea is that this healing technique is a bridge that can carry you to where you need to go and how to access those other sort of realms of intuition and connection as well so so that's the uh that's the fundamental message and I think I'd like to say that it doesn't matter how hard it may seem um that there is always hope and there is always a solution um and uh you just have to take that first step really I think yeah and as you say it's the only way it's the only way forward once you're awake, you're awake. Once that toe is out of the matrix, you know, you have no choice. You can't cover yourself up again. You know, you know what you know. That's right. Everything else is pretense, you know. It's like, for example, you know, if you find that someone's cheated on you, do you, you know, you might go back into denial, but you're never going to, it's never quite going to be the same. You might forgive them and move on, but, it, you know, something's kind of broken there, you know. And it's the same. It's the same thing with uh, you know coming out of the matrix. You know, you you realize it's like, do you really want to stay in that? In, you know, uh, you know what you know, and you can't unknow that. Yes, uh, basically. So yeah. So but um, there's been hard times in my 16 years of journey, but I don't I don't regret it, and I'm so glad I'm where I am, and yeah. certainly the relationship between myself and my kids has never been they're both awake both my kids are awake both my kids um I'm one for one one <laughs> 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 is what is it <laughs> yeah and that's so rewarding sharing that with them um, yeah. yeah that's uh it's uh even if it's you know for for no other reason um, and, and I suppose I would like to say that both Claire and I have been through so much that uh, it is, there is nothing you can say to us as practitioners that we do not have empathy, compassion, sympathy, and understanding of. That's exactly right. That is exactly right because I've realized, you know, to be honest with you, in terms of my friends, I choose those that have, that have people who have been broken and have got back up or who have, you know, terrible, had terrible experiences in their childhood or lives um, and, and survived, survived and grown stronger and have recreated their lives. And I find them so much more interesting to be with than someone who's born with a silver spoon in their mouth. What, what do they know? What can they, what strength of character, what have they learned, do you know what I mean, on their journey? Um, yes, and, and those yeah. people often have so many ego defense mechanisms to hold themselves in their perfect little world. They don't hear anything beyond that. That's exactly right. I think one thing that makes me really, really sad, because I used to be a financial journalist, so of course, in the 2008 global financial crash, uh, I was writing about it. I was working for a company. And what made me sad were the stories of people who committed suicide because they'd lost everything. And I think that. Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> I think that to so 
closely identify your self-worth and your sta- your social standing with money, that if you lose it all, you feel that you're, you've, you've got nothing left, you're nothing left to live for. I think that's really sad. It really upsets me. I find that yes. Sad. I was chatting to a counsellor last week and he was talking about uh, parts journeys. So, you know, like if we're broke, that is one part of ourself. And we, when we're focused on one part, we're only thinking about that part that's broken, feeling all of that, and we're forgetting the other 27 or 100 parts of ourselves that are to do with relationships and friendships and this and that. And if, when we're overwhelmed in one part, we forget. We forget the rest of ourselves. So, That's yeah. exactly right. I think there was a book called, and it was one of those really popular books, like um, it wasn't Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, it was, but it was, kind of, it was like one of those, and it was sort of, it had a table. And it said in the table that you have to have things like, you know, outside interests and family and job and hobby. And so yes. that if only one of those areas goes wrong or glitchy, yes. you have this whole support network that you've created for yourself yes that will help bring you back into balance and I think that's right it's so important to be able to do that yeah yeah so thank you so much Claire for joining me today I look forward to chatting to you again soon and uh good on you and what what is your Facebook page again the etheric soul that's correct I love that I love that thank you thank you you so much talk to you again soon